Well, good morning. Welcome to Liberty Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're here for our 8.30 time of worship. If you're a visitor, we're especially glad that you're here. I forgot my prop. I normally have a card, but uh, there's a card in the pew in front of you that says welcome. And uh, if you are visiting today, we'd love for you to take just a few moments to fill that card out so we can have a record of your visit. And also, uh, we can learn more about you and your family. We love getting those cards. You can put it in the offering plate or give it to one of our ushers on the way out. Uh, and we, we, do, we are glad that you're here if you are visiting. So uh, please take just a few moments to do that for us. Well, I want to uh, remind you of a few things in your proclaimer today. First of all, uh, for everyone who had a part in uh, both Autumn Fest and Scarecrow Hollow, we are so thankful to you. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. Uh, and all that you did to make that those two events possible. Uh, they were very successful, and uh, we, we just love reaching out to the community and know that that is also your heartbeat as well. And so we, um, we think that both of the events were a, a great success. So thank you so much, volunteers, and everyone who prayed and was just uh, beseeching the Lord on, on our behalf so that we could just reach out to our community. So thank you so much. Well, I want to also invite you to be a part of our... Um, Billy Graham, Hope for America. Uh, we're taking part in this. This is uh, on, let's see, let me make sure I get everything right. On Thursday, November 7th at 7 p.m., we're going to open the sanctuary up, and uh, we're invi- you're all invited to a worship service. And uh, Thursday, November 7th, is Billy Graham's 95th birthday. And so he has, the, he has uh, done a special message, and it's called My Hope America. And so if you... Uh, want to be a part of that, then you can either come here to the sanctuary and uh, just watch here on the screen and be a part of a worship service. But also, if you'd like to open up your home, uh, they really want for people to open their homes up and be hosts for this event so that maybe you can invite your neighbors who wouldn't otherwise go to church. Uh, And so we we would love for you to just uh, take a, if you want that, then we have a resource pack for you. So if you want to be a host, then you can contact the church office and they will give you a a pack of information so that you can be a host home and invite your neighbors, people that live where you live and, um, and uh, to to experience My Hope America with, uh, of course, with Billy Graham. And so, um, you know, this is a really amazing thing. Uh, God has used Billy Graham in such a wonderful way. Uh, in so many people's lives, so uh, we're excited about this as well. Another thing is, uh, I told you a, a couple of weeks ago, if you pay attention during the announcements, I had some uh, some cars. I didn't make the cars. I think Scott Hargis made the cars, but there were these little, uh, what do you call those cars? Soapbox cars? I don't know. What are they? No, they're not soapbox cars. Somebody help me out. What are they? The little cars. They're like a wedge, and you roll them down a hill. What are they called? Derby cars, that's what it is. Okay, so they're going to uh, they're gonna race those. I told you they would race them, and they're going to race them on October 27th at 2 p.m. So if you took part in that, then uh, that's your race day. So you can you know wear your like uh, race suit if you want to and uh, wear your favorite race hat, and maybe that will bring you some luck. Anyways, okay. Uh, a couple more things uh, is trunk or treat. We want to uh, – now, quick pop quiz – Nobody knew that I asked, how many parking spots are there outside at the front of the church? You walk by it every single Sunday. How many are there? Does anybody know? Not 17. 22 that go this way. Now, there are three that go that way down there, but there are 22 that go this way. Uh, And we only have eight folks signed up for Trunk or Treat. So you do the math. We need 14 more folks to sign up. Uh, and you can do this in couples or in a group, however you want to do it. It can be very elaborate how you decorate your trunk, or you can just keep it simple. Have like a bucket of candy, and people love it. The kids love it. Um, anyways, we, we are also, if you can't be a part of Trunk or Treat with a trunk, then uh, you can also just bring individually wrapped candy and uh, put it here outside the church office. Uh, we are just, we're excited again about an opportunity to reach out to our community. So please be a part of Trunk or Treat as well. Well, why don't we all stand and greet one another as we begin today. Let's sing together. I love you with a love of the Lord. 
Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you. service today by giving praise to God from whom all blessings flow. today and God we do recognize you as the source of all good and the source of all blessing that we have and God today may our hearts be thankful God thank you thankful for what you're doing in the life of this church thankful for what you have done in our lives through the person of Jesus thankful for the direction of the Holy Spirit thankful for the body your church Thankful for the cross, thankful for Christian friends, 
thankful for the willing service of this church. And God, today and may through this series, God, may we just pause long enough to say, God, we recognize you for who you are. God, the source of all good. And may we bow our knee and lift our hands and just say, thank you, God. Thank you for the good that you have done. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you that you come to us where we are. And God, may we see you as the one from whom all blessings flow. Be with us today. God, may you never allow us to become ungrateful people. God, may we not be, be like unfaithful people in times past who could not see the good that you were doing. But God, may we recognize your goodness and may we be thankful in all situations. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today we begin a journey towards 
a more thankful heart. And today I can't think of a better place to start our journey over these next several weeks than right here at the Lord's table. This table represents the body that was broken and the blood that was poured out for us. God, who did not need us, came to us, stood in our place, died on our behalf so that we can have life. And what more awesome message to be thankful for than that. If you're here today and you have received the Lord Jesus in your heart, then this table is for you. If you have not, this table stands as a representation that today you need to bow your knee before the cross. Today you need to say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. God, I trust in Jesus for my salvation. And so if you're not here and you're not a Christian, then my call to you is to come and trust the Lord. If you are a Christian today, let's celebrate what God has done. And maybe in these moments of reflection, maybe ask this question to yourself, God, am I truly thankful for what you have done for me?
Bible says that Jesus gathered, Jesus gathered his disciples, and while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after he prayed a blessing. Wayne, I'm going to ask you to have a blessing for the bread. Let us pray. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this Sunday morning that you've given us to come into your house. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for what this church means to this community. And Father, as we gather around the table and partake of the Lord's Supper, I pray that you would bless the hands that have prepared it. I pray that you would bless each person that will partake of the juice and the bread this morning. Father, I ask that you would be with each one of us as we think about our own lives, as we try to reach out and do more for you in this church, in this community, and in the world as well. Father, as a representation of this bread that we're about to partake, of the cruel death of your body being ripped open on Calvary's cross, Be with each person now as they partake of the bread. For it's in your name that I pray. Amen. The Bible says, And Jesus broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body.
the Bible says, and then Jesus took a cup and gave thanks. Carol, I'm going to ask you to give thanks for the cup. Let us pray. Hey, Eternal Father, we are so thankful and so grateful for the name of Jesus. We're so grateful and thankful, Father, for the sacrifice that your Son gave to each one of us when he went to that cruel cross. And Father, as we look upon your Son on that cross, Father, we thank you today for the blood that was shed, Father, when they pierced his side and the blood flowed from his side. And Father, that blood today covers a multitude of our sins. And Father, we just thank you today for your son, for his sacrifice. And Father God, that we today that know you as Lord and Savior can drink of this cup. We ask that you bless this cup. And Father, help us and use us to further your kingdom here and around the world. And we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says, And Jesus gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. After partaking of the supper, they sang a hymn together. Let's stand together as we sing about the everlasting God that we serve and we worship.
Would you pray with me this morning? We thank you, Father, we're able to come into your house again. We thank you for the many who are here. We thank you for the faithfulness of this church, Lord, and that we are becoming less me-centered and more centered for their community. Help us to remember, Lord, that you gave so much for us in your sacrifice as we remember at the communion table. We thank you for the blessings we enjoy this church, the blessings we enjoy as a church family and our individual families. We ask that you be with all that are here this morning, Lord. May they hear your word with eager ears and hearts willing to be softened by the words that are there. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us and ask that you bless the rest of this service now. And, and thank you, Lord, for all that you do in our lives and for keeping us for your care. Amen. Well, I want to echo the thanks for yesterday, for all the people who worked so diligently and so hard to make our fall event a success. I know some of you have come to church today tired. That's okay. You know, it's, it's okay to come to church on Sunday if you have been involved in some type of ministry or interacting with people throughout the week. In, in my mind, that's the way you ought to come every week, right? You ought to be out, you ought to be doing, you ought to be serving. And so when we stop coming to church tired because we've been reaching out, uh, then we might be missing out in a big way. And so today, I want to start a new sermon series simply entitled, Blessed. Now what is interesting about this time of year, it's a wonderful time of year, but we will quickly move through a successive series of holidays, and then lo and behold, 2013 will be over. The calendar has been planned, everything is set, now you just hold on, and we'll be at the end of the year before we know it. And so the purpose of this series, especially in this time in the life of our church, is to teach us that even in the midst of a hectic schedule, even in the midst of a busy time of life, that we have to learn, we have to stop and just tell God, thank you for the good that you have provided. Now over the next several weeks, 
we're going to look at and reflect upon the positive things that God has done. Now, let me tell you what's off limits for just five weeks, all right? These are off limits. We're not going to allow ourselves to be consumed with the negative, with the broken, with the undone, uh, with the struggling. We're not going to do that. Do I deny the reality of all of those things? Absolutely not. They're real. But is it too much to take five weeks and not always drift our eyes to that which is broken, that which is undone, that which is wrong, that which is struggling, and just for a moment, just for five simple weeks, focus on what is good. And then to just stop and say, God, we thank you. Now sometimes people think that when we think about the good things that God has done and that we won't allow ourselves just for a few weeks to be consumed or focused on those things that on some way or another we are denying uh, that, that bad things are around. Let me, let me tell you, I'm not denying that bad things are around. I'm very aware that bad things are around. But I'm also aware the good things are around. And sometimes we just need a reminder to focus on those. I sometimes get in conversations uh, with people who don't believe in God or are very having struggles with faith issues. And this is the number one thing they always want to talk to me about. They want to say, uh, Rusty, why is there so much suffering and evil in the world? And they'll come with me with this question. And, and it's a very valid question. And it's a question that needs to be talked about, and it's a question that some resolution needs to be uh, come to. And so they sit there and they, they, they complain about why this and why this problem and why this suffering. And sometimes I turn the question back around on them. I say, you know, we, we've, we've been so consumed here with the question of why they're suffering and evil, but I said, have we ever reflected upon the fact that why, why, why there is good at all? I mean, why, why do we deserve to experience joy in life? Is that something that we just naturally are supposed to have? Or why do we do that? Or why, why is life in certain moments fulfilling? Well, the Bible has an answer to that question, and it's found in James chapter 1, verse 17. And, and the Bible says it like this. It says that every generous act and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with him, there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. The Bible shouts to us that the reason that there are good things in life, the reason that we are to thank God is because he is the one, he is the source of all good things. Listen, if something good happens in your life, God is the one that has provided it. I think it's important for us to realize that if something good has come, then our, our thanksgiving is to be God-directed. I wonder how many times do we thank God for the good that He has provided as often as we complain for the bad that He has allowed. You know, this series is just to reform our thinking. Now, I'm going to give you some homework during this series. And here's the homework. You ready for it? I want you to write two notes, at least two notes before this series is over. You ready? Note number one. Note number one, I want you to write a thank you note to God. Over the next several weeks, I want you to think about what God has done in your life, the good that he has provided, and I want you to get a pen and pad out, and I want you to sit down and write a thank you note. You say, Rusty, well, I can just tell him. Well, I know you can just tell him, but it's something about putting it down and you looking at it is going to make it more real and help you to be more thankful. Now, I'm going to really up, the, up, the, uh, up, up my standard here a little bit. Now, if you would be so nice to write a thank you note to God about the good things that he has done, and then one note you keep for yourself, but if you would be so bold and it's appropriate, I want you to copy the letter, but I don't want you to put your name on it, the second letter. And then I want you to mail that letter, guess what? To P.O. Box 485, Appomattox, Virginia. That's the P.O. Box for the church. And then this is what I'm going to do as part of the introduction of some of the next few sermons. I'm just going to pick at random 
some of the letters that you have sent in, and I'm just going to read some of the things you're thankful for. Now, you know, if you've written a letter for yourself, you can edit out the things you don't want publicly known, but things that God has done that you want publicly known, uh, that you don't mind sharing, and by the way, I'm not going to use your name, you know, just to help us see what God is doing. Because I think one thing that Satan can do is God can be doing a lot of positive things, and he doesn't let us share that with one another, and then we become discouraged, and God is really doing a lot of good things around. Now, the second thank you note, so thank you note to God. The second thank you note is I want you to write a thank you note to someone who has been a blessing to you. And I, I, I'll, I'll let you write an email. I know some of you letter writings out, and that's fine. Uh, emails are just fine, too, if that's the way people communicate. But just to say, to tell someone, thank you for what you have done for me. And we're going to look at an interesting section of the book of Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 46 today, but we're going to look at Psalm 46, Psm 47, Psalm 48, 148, 149, 150. And the reason that we're going to look at these psalms is because these psalms are called the Hallelujah Psalms. And there's one simple reason that they're called the Hallelujah Psalms is because Psalm 146 through 150, all the psalms begin with the word Hallelujah and they end with the word Hallelujah. So every one of those psalms are bracketed out in a unique way because they begin with the word Hallelujah and they end end with the word hallelujah. Now it's interesting that there are, the, the book of Psalms is written by a lot of different people, right? The book of Psalms is written by a lot of different people, but there was only one person who put all the Psalms together. It's almost like the hymn book was written by a lot of different hymn writers, but somebody put the whole hymnal together, and it's interesting that when the book of Psalms was put together, that the final chorus of the book of Psalms was praise. After all the struggles, after all the prayers, after all the laments, after all the probing of uh, prayerful thoughts, the psalmist ends the book of Psalms on a note of praise, trusting God for the good that he has done. Really, uh, Psalm 150 will end, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, hallelujah. And the final note will be Struck. So if you have your Bibles today, let's begin this journey towards seeing our blessing and being thankful. If you have your Bible, let's go to Psalm 146, verses 1 through 10, where we will see why we should praise the God who helps us. The first point today is that we praise the Lord who helps us because only God is able to to really help us or truly help us. Look at verse 1. It says, Hallelujah, my soul praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. Do not trust in nobles, in man who cannot save. When his breath leaves him, he returns to the ground. On that day, his plan dies. Now, interestingly enough, if we're going to study the Hallelujah Psalms, we need to know what the word Hallelujah means. Now, as a child, we used to sing a very repetitive song. The song went, Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Then what do you say? Praise ye the Lord. You know, you know what the word, you know what, you know what Hallelujah actually means? Praise the Lord. It's the most repetitive song ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's just two ways of saying the same thing. Uh, there's two Hebrew words that get smooshed together. The word hallel means praise, and the word Yahweh, which is the shortened verse, they just smush them together. Hallelujah. It means praise the Lord. So the word hallelujah is just a smushed up word that actually means praise the Lord. So when you say hallelujah, you're really saying Praise the Lord. All right, you're figuring this out now. So when you, when you say the word hallelujah, it's just not something to fill space. It is a recognition that God is to be praised. Okay, and so the psalmist is going to discuss now the nature of his praise. Interestingly enough, Psalm 146, he says, Hallelujah, my soul praise the Lord. Now listen, real praise is not superficial. 
and nor is it just merely religious. Super, uh, superficial praise really has no place in the psalmist's mind. He says that his soul praises the Lord. Listen, if you take our journey to see the goodness of God, this won't be a thank you note that you write or just a superficial thank you to God. This will be a deep-seated praise and thanksgiving that God has done something in your life and that you're, that you're able to see it. You know, I really believe if you'll take this journey with us over the next several weeks that you will truly be changed. And so the psalmist says, my soul praise the Lord. And then the praise that the psalmist is able to embody, he says that he's going to learn to praise God through all of his life. You know, even in the New Testament, a characteristic of a spirit-filled person is a person who is ready and always is making melody in their heart to the Lord. This is part, the, the concept of being able to see the goodness of God and to live in, uh, in light of his worthiness is very much a part of us becoming who we need to be. Now God, the, the psalmist here talks about uh, why God is to be praised and he looks at why God's to be praised because he contrasts God's help versus the help of man. And then he says, don't trust in nobles, in man who cannot save. Now, the psalmist is not really running down uh, the help that people give. He's just saying that the help that people give uh, is temporary. See, the psalmist is going to talk about today that God is worthy to be praised because he helps us. And boy, this is a big point about who God is. And so the psalmist says, don't trust in nobles, don't trust in people, not because people are not good. The problem is, he says, at, he says that their breath will leave them, uh, and then on the day that their breath leaves them, the day that they die, guess what also happens to their help? It's gone. And so the psalmist is not telling us that, that people are not helpful. He's just saying they can't truly help to the uttermost because they may be there, they may be ready to help, and then the next thing you know, they're gone, and then their help is no more. You know, but I do want us to think about today as we move through this series is to thank God for the temporary help that people give. I mean, we're all limited people. We can only give so much, and we can only give so long because our life is only but so long. But it's good today to begin to say, uh, who's helping me right now? Who's there being used of God to help me? And may I recognize that this will not be forever, and so I should thank God for their temporary help, at least right now. Or maybe you reflect upon in this series that who has helped you in times past and thank God for these people. But then to realize, as the psalmist realizes, that their help is limited. Limited by their ability and limited by the span of their life. It's still something to be thankful for, but it's not something that can be overly relied upon. And the psalmist contrasts the temporary help of others with the eternal help of God. He says, don't trust in nobles, don't trust in men, because, well, their breath will leave them. But God is the one who will always be there. I think about the 23rd Psalm, where the psalmist reflects on this same reality. The psalmist in the 23rd Psalm says, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the place where everyone leaves me because I'm on the other side of the grave, the psalmist says, but you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the, the, the God who is with us now will be the same God who is with us forever. So the psalmist begins to say, do we realize today that God is truly the one who can help us in a different way than other people? Now the second point today is that we praise the Lord who helps us not only because he can he is eternal and can truly help us he'll never leave us but we praise the Lord who helps us because 
God contains all power. Look at verse 5. It says, Happy is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. God is not only an eternal help, but the psalmist now begins to reflect on the nature of the person to whom is helping. He's not just a forever helper. He's the helper who had the power to create the universe. There are two acts of creation that the psalmist reflects upon. He reflects first upon the creation uh, of the people of God. At that point in time, it was the nation of Israel. And he says, happy is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, the one who created the people of God. But not only did he create the people of God, he's the one who created the very creation itself. The one who created and the one who sustains his world is going to be the one who remains faithful forever. You know, in the New Testament, we are to reflect upon the, the goodness that we see in creation as, uh, as, as a means by which to, to make it through the difficult seasons of life. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, uh, the Apostle Peter reflecting on God as creator, he says, and so those who suffer according to God's will should, uh, in doing good, should entrust themselves to a faithful creator you know this idea that our hope is really our hope is truly in a faithful creator i don't know if you you know the the real the biblical answer to the problem of evil the problem of suffering is that god is able to remake whatever is broken that's the ultimate answer i mean really if you have eyes to see the story of the bible it's the God who creates. And then as sin enters the world, sin in many ways decays and uncreates God's world. It all falls apart. And then if you have eyes to see it, when Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus is the one who appears and he begins, if you notice, to restore that which has been broken due to sin. It is Jesus who makes the blind eyes do what? See, what is he doing? He's setting things back as they should be. It is Jesus who makes the lame man walk. It's Jesus who makes the deaf man hear. Jesus is the one coming to his broken world in acts of creation, and he is putting things back in order and then he comes to all of us and says, will you trust me? I'll do something in you from the inside out. The real answer to the suffering of the world is that we believe that in the final act, no matter how bad things get, that God is able to put it all back together. It is not, it is, it is not by accident that some of the final words of the Bible refer to the creative and the recreative activity of God. The final scene of the Bible is that God has taken the world in its broken up mess and some of the final words of the Bible are this. I'm not only going to wipe away every tear, not only am I going to abolish death and grief and crying and pain, the final words are, look, I am making all things new and so you say rusty you don't understand how messed up my situation is today you don't understand how broken down my life is well maybe i don't but i do know the one who created you and i do know the one who created this world and the bible shouts to us no matter how broken you are that he can remake you he can redeem you uh, and you can trust him in the process well, you know what? The psalmist has really gotten us off to a good start. He says that God is only the one who can really help because his help is eternal. 
And God is the only one who can really help because only He has the real creative and recreative ability to bring about restoration to your situation. But the third and final point that the psalmist makes as he reflects on God's eternal, eternality and he reflects on God's creative power, he then says something that we might not expect. We praise the Lord who helps us because God condescends. That's a big word, but it means he stoops down to help those, uh, to help the weak. Look at verse 7, it says, it says, executing justice for the, for the exploited, giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects the foreigner, and he helps the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Zion, your God, reigns for all generations. And look how this psalm ends. Hallelujah. He puts the note on it again. Now just notice this. That God is the one who is able to truly help. And God is the one who has the power to help. But you would think if God came to help, if he came to man to be with where, where man is, that he would at least come to the best of us, right? You'd think that. I mean, if a dignitary came, he, wouldn't come, he would come to the best of us. He, he'd try to find the, the, most, uh, the most socialized, the most educated, the most talented. He'd come to the best of us, right? That's the way it typically works. But when God came to us, he did not come to the best of us, Psalm 146 says. In many ways, he came to the ones who needed the most help. I mean, look at the li list here. The God who comes to help helps the exploited, he helps the hungry, he helps the prisoner, he helps the oppressed, he helps the foreigner, he helps the fatherless, and he helps the widow. There's the list of all the people that God has come to help because the God who comes to help is, is the one who goes to the place of help to the one who has the greatest need. Now, I'm not sure we understand this. This is really the place where I want us to end today. Do we really embrace the reality that the God who, who, who needs none of us and who is the creator of this world says that he is willing to come and to help the least of us? Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. It's difficult for a lot of us to break our schedules for half a day to help somebody who's really in need. I don't know if you really try to help people who are in need. I mean, if you really make it a part of your life, it takes up a lot of time and takes up a lot of energy. I mean, if you really get invested in people, it takes up a lot of time and it takes up a lot of energy. And if you begin to do it, you'll be on the phone, you'll be running errands, you'll be doing all different types of things. And yet, here this Psalm 146 paints this picture of God. It's the God who comes to help and comes to help in the most radical way to the most needy. That's the God who we serve. You know what? I can't help but end Psalm 146 with, except with this reflection. You know, the Psalm 146 reflects on the God who comes to help us. But I can't help but think about Jesus, the one who has already come to help. You know, you think about, we really have more insight than the psalmist had. It had blown the psalmist's mind to realize that after these words were penned, that God himself would step out of heaven and would come to earth and he would come to the least and he would come to the exploited and he would come to the weak and would preach the gospel and that they would be saved. The question here today is, are you willing to be helped by the God who wants to help you? You say, Rusty, I don't see any blessings in my life. Oh, we got one blessing today. No matter how broken your situation is, you got one huge blessing. You know what it is? You've got a God who wants to help you. That's a lot. You say, Rusty, man, I'm broken up. 
What am I to be thankful for? That there's a God who is willing to stoop down to where you are and yet has enough power to pick you up from where you are. That's really good news. A God who is willing to go to where you are, but it has enough power to pull you out of where you are. That is really good news. And so if you're here today, and there's never been a time and a place where you say, God, I admit I'm a sinner, I am helpless, and I need you, and I trust in the cross today, I trust in you because I believe that you're the God who wants to help me. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, today's the day. God has come for the purpose of helping you. That is why he's come. He's been motivated by his love, he's been motivated by his grace, and he has come. And so if you're here today and you're not a Christian, the altar is open. And if you are a Christian today, this is really just the start of a series. But may we never become too busy to be thankful. Isn't God doing a lot of good things? He's doing a lot of good things in this church. If you look around, he's probably doing a lot of good things in your life. And it's probably just not good to not tell God thank you for those things. And so I really hope that when this series is over, that you will truly feel blessed. Because if you have received the God who has come to help you and realize that he's still around to do so, you truly are blessed. And I hope you know that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're the God who comes to help us. And God, sometimes we forget so many of the simple things, God, the most obvious realities, God, that you're there, you're helping us, you're prodding us, you're seeking us. God, we don't even see it. And then, God, sometimes your help comes through for us and you work things out. And then, God, we don't thank you. So, God, may we become more thankful people. God, may we realize and see the blessings that are all around us. Help us, Heavenly Father, not to live life presuming upon your grace, taking blessings for granted. God, may we see the people that you have placed around us. God, may we see you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thy will, thy 
Thy promises so rich in me fulfill. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to just as an appropriate end to the service while we sit here in these quiet moments. Why don't you just pray this simple prayer to God to say, God, thank you that you're willing to help me because I need you. Father, we thank you that you have come to help. Not because other people need it, but because we need it. And God, may we realize our utter dependency upon you. God, not only how you save us, but how you sustain us. And may we become more acutely aware of it. God, may we truly be thankful that you help us. God, that we don't think that this is our thing that we're doing, but it's your thing that you're doing. Help us, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this wonderful time today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. Bye.